This is the story of an American hero, a man of the deep south with strong moral values and a firm commitment to God and his country. Those who knew him remember him as being tough but fair, a man they'll never forget. He was the recipient of the Carnegie Medal and the Medal of Honor, the only person in history to receive both awards. His name was Jimmy Dias. His homes were Augusta, Georgia, Clemson College, and the United States Marine Corps. This is his story. Fourth of July weekend is a time to reflect on our nation's independence and patriotism, of course. Though he may not be a household name, the story of Marine Colonel Jimmy Dias exemplifies the very best of our patriotic values. General Smith, good morning. Nice to see you. Thank you, Katie. Nice to be back. He was a good man for all those reasons, but yes. in the, for the purpose of full disclosure, he was also your father-in-law. That's true. He <laughs> was my father-in-law, and I finally got around to writing the book, which should have been written a long time ago. Why? Well, he's the only person in history who, who has earned America's two highest awards for heroism, the Carnegie Medal and the Medal of Honor. And it's a story that needs to be told because we need heroes, we need people to look up to, and he certainly is in that category. Let's talk about why he won both of those medals, General Smith. First, the Carnegie Medal. He was only 19 years old. He was walking on the beach in South Carolina, Sullivan's Island, near uh, Charleston, and there was a woman that was being swept out to sea in a big storm, and another woman had gone in to try to rescue her but was not being successful. And he was walking to the beach and everybody was jumping up and down and so he just went in by himself and actually saved both women. One of them was really in desperate shape. The other one was just very, very tired. But if he had not gone in, they probably both would have drowned. And for that, he won the Carnegie Medal at age 19. He was an undergraduate at Clemson College when he did that. And meanwhile, the Carnegie Medal is still given out? And it has to be at great risk to their lives. And many people who win the Carnegie Medal earn it posthumously because they try to save somebody and die in the process. But it's a very tightly controlled medal. It's been given out since 1904. It's called the Carnegie Medal, and they give about 80 or 90 out every year. He did get the Medal of Honor, sadly, after he died. Yes, Tell he me did. about the circumstances surrounding that act of bravery. Well, after he uh, left Clemson College, he went back to uh, Augusta, which was his home, and uh, went into the Marine Corps Reserves, was called up to active duty in 1940, and then in 1944, as a battalion commander, he had 800 people under his command, they attacked the Marshall Islands. And the first day of the battle, he went behind enemy lines to rescue four Marines from another unit. Again, people he didn't know, but they were in trouble. They were all wounded. They would have been killed by the Japanese. They were pinned down. He saved those people. And then the next day, uh, at the end, very end of the battle, he was leading his troops right up front and was killed. And for his heroism during the Battle of the Marshals, he won the Medal of Honor. Strangely enough, he had sort of a premonition uh, about did. about dying there, didn't he? He did have a premonition. He talked to a lawyer, he talked to some people on the ship about the fact that he thought he would die in the battle. He was an upfront kind of guy. He was a leader up front. He was always in front of his troops. And he knew the risks were high, and I think he thought he was probably going to be killed, and he was. The man who took over the battalion, the next, was killed in the next battle. This is a story of an incredibly heroic bunch of Marines, the 4th Marine Division, who fought in four battles. This was just the first one that he fought in. He is appreciated in his home state, isn't he, and at Clemson. Yes, in, 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 in Augusta, they've named a new parkway after him. The Marine Corps and Navy Reserve Center is named after him. And they're beginning to do things for him at Clemson University also. Why did you think it was so important that the rest of the country should learn about him? Well, we just need role models. We need people we can look out up for. It's a, such a unique story. When I realized in my research he was the only one, it brought tears to my eyes that this was a unique story. It had to be told. And I hope people will look up to Jimmy Dias and say, young people and say, I'd like to be like him. I'd like to act like him. I would like to have his leadership skills. I would like to have his courage. And yet he was incredibly modest, wasn't he? He was. He never talked about the Carnegie Medal. I interviewed people, friends of his, who were in their late 80s and early 90s, and I said, what about the Carnegie Medal? And they said they didn't know anything about it. He won it, earned it, and never talked about it. Aquila James Dias was born in Augusta, Georgia on January 11, 1909. The Dias family were faithful Christians who lived by a strict code of personal behavior and discipline. Church membership 
attendance and support were a major part of their lives. Although they lived in the small village of North Augusta in South Carolina, the first Presbyterian church on Telfair Street in downtown Augusta was the church of the entire Dias family. This church had a long history of service to the Augusta community and had been led by a number of distinguished pastors. Hard work, Sunday school attendance, support for the community, patriotism for America, and abstinence from alcoholic beverages were deeply held commitments of Augusta Presbyterians as well as most Augustans of other faiths and denominations. Diaz thrived in the Boy Scout movement, which was very robust in Augusta in the 1920s. He was a member of Troop 4, supported by the First Baptist Church. In 1925, Diaz was one of five Boy Scouts who were selected to represent Augusta on a trip to Washington, D.C. The train took us to Washington and parked us in the Union Station there. That was our headquarters. And anyway, the boy, we attended meetings. We did all kinds of various things around in Washington. But one of the most significant things that happened to us was that the five of us in uniform were walking through the park one morning and we came to a lady, one lady, and she stopped us to speak to us, a friendly sort of lady, and it was Mrs. Calvin Coolidge for her morning walk. She had one security man, had a collar dog with her, but she, it was just so significant to us to get to meet the wife of the President of the United States. Scouting is a safe haven for kids. We talk about all the opportunities that young people have to get in trouble today. And first and foremost, you can go to a Boy Scout meeting and you can be in a safe environment. Uh, when you're there, you're with good quality, trained leaders who are excellent role models. You're with, with peers who will test you and make you a better person. As you go along, you'll develop your leadership skills, you'll develop your citizenship, you'll develop your fitness. And when you get through with your scouting career, most likely you're going to be a much better person for the time that you've put into it. One of the, one of the lasting tributes that we have to Jimmy Dias is the Dias program in our Boy Scout camp. Every first year scout goes through a special program to get him used to the rigors of a, of a week at camp and to prepare for his outdoor adventures in a scouting career. We named it after Jimmy Dias because everything that he's done through his scouting, through his college life, through his uh, life in the military is exactly what we want our young people to do when they grow up and when they become leaders and when they become the future scout leaders, civic leaders, and business leaders of our community. Dias spent all four of his high school years from 1923 to 1927 at the Academy of Richmond County. This venerable school was the oldest incorporated institution in Georgia, having been established on July 31st, 1783. We drilled every day. We had parades, we marched up and down Telfair Street practicing, but then on Memorial Day and other special days, we carried our guns, we had guns. We marched on Broad Street and from up the monument on down to the city, city cemetery where we honored the, the Confederate dead on Memorial Day. Although Dias played a great deal of football for the Richmond Academy team, his greatest successes came not in sports but in military drill. There was military competition in numerous areas of cadet life. Especially important was the competition of close order drill where the cadets could highlight their marching ability. Dias won more prizes for his drill leadership than any other cadet in his class. In 1927, the year of his graduation, there were more than 400 boys in the four-year school. 60 graduated that year, including Pinky Dias, now a tall, handsome football player who was also an officer in the cadet corps. The summer of 1927 
brought the next big challenge in Dias's life, for he was off to Clemson College, or as it was then called, Clemson Agricultural College of South Carolina. Dias chose Clemson for a number of reasons, but two were fundamental. First of all, he wanted to play college football. Clemson was not at the top in the football rankings and did not attract the very best of the high school athletes. But Dias felt Clemson's football program was ideal for him. He thought he would have a better chance of making the Clemson team than at one of the bigger football powers. Also, the Clemson coach had a fine reputation for building a good program with the athletes he had. The second strong attraction that Clemson had for Dias was that it was then a military school. From its founding in 1889, Clemson had been a military institution where every student wore a uniform all of the time on campus. Dias had so enjoyed the military regimen of the Academy of Richmond County that he looked forward to the order, discipline, and camaraderie that had defined Clemson College since its founding. The Clemson campus of the present day gives little evidence of how small and rural the area was in the 1920s. The town of Clemson then numbered only a few hundred people, most of whom were either faculty or administrative people at the college or their family members. There was one gas station, one drugstore, and one general store. Most of the roads were unpaved. Located 100 miles north of Augusta in the extreme northwest corner of South Carolina, Clemson was a four-hour automobile trip for Jimmy when he enrolled in September 1927. His life was fairly spartan, as best I can, can tell, and the stories that I've heard and the uh, accounts I've read. Um, life was pretty well structured for the cadets who were here. Um, they worked very hard. Uh, all of their time was accounted for. And it was uh, a time which I think brought out uh, many wonderful qualities in the students who were here. Uh, there was a certain character and leadership quality that was established under that kind of regiment that uh, is something that, that Clemson is very proud of. It's something that has uh, benefited us th through to today. But it clearly was not a time of, uh, of uh, the kind of uh, relaxed atmosphere and pretty much a sort of self-disciplined uh, environment which we have on our campus today. It was very much disciplined by the military uh, structure that was in place. It's not surprising that people have looked back on it, alums who've looked back on it, and with an almost fond voice have called this the brotherhood of misery. Way isolated in the country, dirt roads to get anywhere, a trip to Anderson, a major event, a trip to Greenville, a paralyzing event, no way to get out of here, no cars allowed on campus for freshmen or sophomores or in the earlier days, no cars allowed on campus for any cadet. Cadets did have cars hidden in the woods around the campus that they would use to try to make vigorous escapes from the campus. Um, freshmen were the backbone of the cleanliness brigade. The sophomores looked after the freshmen to make sure that they would bring the right shaving water warm enough for the rest of the table. Freshmen were the ones who served food at the table, and they served all the food until the upperclassmen were finished before they really got to eat their own. So it was one where rank knew its privilege. It was one which was a brotherhood of misery, and it was one that produced men who have turned out to be fine leaders in society. Football was a hugely important part of Dias' life his first three years at Clemson. He came and he played tough football. He began as a freshman player on the freshman team. At the end of his first year, he moved up to the varsity team. That varsity team would have very good years while he was here. He played with some of the finest players in the country, and he played his heart out. As a sophomore, he was moved from end to tackle. This was a year that Dias played on the same offensive and defensive line with the great O.K. Presley, the unanimous choice as All-Southern Conference Center in 1928. Presley's recollections of college football in the late 1920s were quite vivid. Players would often hit each other with their fists and on occasion kick opponents in the face when they were down. 
It was a common practice for players to work on the injury of an opponent in an attempt to knock him out of the game. In a game with South Carolina, O.K. saw every player on the first team, except one, carried off the field in a stretcher. The youngsters were not heavily armed. They weren't really padded up well. They played a much looser game of football than we do today. They were really students who came to school and were not recruited for ball, but recruited the coach to let them play. And that's the way it was. It's a reverse of what happens today. 1929 was to be his last as a college football player. Dias wanted to play as a senior, but a serious knee injury, which he sustained toward the end of his junior year, ended his football career. The damaged knee would bother him off and on for the rest of his life. With his college football career at an end, Dias's interest in sports now shifted from football to the rifle team. Dias had been a member of the rifle team ever since he was a freshman, but by the late fall of his junior year, he was devoting increasing attention to his skills as a marksman. Dias had a number of uh, uh, remarkable achievements while a student at Clemson. He was involved in almost all aspects of campus life. He was a, an athlete, a member of the varsity football team. Uh, he was uh, an officer and a leader in the uh, cadet corps. Um, he was an All-American marksman while he was a, a student here. So he was involved in a lot of campus life and began uh, to show at that time a number of the qualities that, um, that uh, the rest of his life would achieve. And I guess the most remarkable accomplishment he had that between his freshman and sophomore years, he was awarded the uh, Carnegie Medal for Heroism, which is the highest uh, award that the United States can give a civilian. When people were in trouble, Dias had a compelling desire to help out, irrespective of what dangers faced him. The date was July 13, 1928. The place was the beach adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean at Sullivan's Island on the coast of South Carolina, just a few miles north of Charleston. A 19-year-old young man with flaming red hair was walking along the beach. Jimmy Dias had just completed his freshman year at Clemson and was enjoying a vacation of sun and surf with his family. A violent summer storm had blown up unexpectedly. It produced high winds and huge waves. The, the surf was particularly bad that day, and a big heavy undertow. And I, I remember my aunt telling me about it in connection with that undertow because she was trying to keep me from getting out in the surf at Charleston. But anyway, he was coming along there and he realized that the two women were in trouble out in the water and couldn't get back. And uh, others were standing around, but he didn't hesitate. Uh, he went into the water and he saved uh, two women from drowning, sure death. And I think anybody who was there that day and, and knew, knew that that's what would, the result it would have been. And again, others were standing around, but he did it. He didn't hesitate, he went in and he saved them at peril of his own life. And even though he was a big strapping man, that undertow could have gotten him easily too, but he did it. He showed courage. For the valor he had displayed, Jimmy Dias was nominated for the Carnegie Medal, a medal that has been awarded since 1904 to heroes who risked their lives in peacetime to save others. He received the award the next year in 1929. The circumstances of Dias's heroism that summer day at the beach are well documented. What is remarkable about the event is that he saved from drowning not one, but two people. Although his heroism was highlighted in the Augusta Chronicle immediately after the rescue, few people in Augusta or at Clemson understood the significance of the award. The Carnegie Hero Fund Commission is a private operating foundation established by Andrew Carnegie in 1904. Its historical roots stem from a massive coal mine disaster in Harwick, Pennsylvania, a small town uh, along the Allegheny River north of Pittsburgh. In January of 1904, a massive explosion took place, uh, killing 179 miners. Among those who responded to the scene in rescue attempts were two other men, 
One was a mining engineer from Pittsburgh, the other was a miner from the nearby town of Leechburg. They entered the mine in, a, in rescue attempts of the victims and lost their lives. Carnegie was so impressed by the fact that these gentlemen had their safety and yet forfeited it for their fellow miners that he had struck two gold medals which he presented to the families of these men. And then after several weeks of thinking about the situation, he acted on a long-held belief that people who act in behalf of others in any civilian context should be recognized. Carnegie had long been of the belief that people who act in heroic fashion in civilian life should somehow receive recognition, much as the military provided recognition for its heroes. Our deed of trust, written by Carnegie shortly after the Harwick uh, mine disaster, opens with a very strong statement. We live in a heroic age. Not seldom are we thrilled by deeds of heroism where men or women are injured or lose their lives in attempting to preserve or rescue their fellows, such the heroes of civilization, the heroes of barbarism maimed or killed theirs. Already at the age of 19, Dias had displayed two of the three most important qualities of a great leader, courage and compassion. Over the next few years, he would develop the third quality, competence. It is very difficult to earn the Carnegie Medal. Many hundreds of people are nominated every year from throughout Canada and the United States, but fewer than 100 people each year receive the award. Just saving a person's life does not qualify someone for the award. Only those who risk their lives voluntarily to an extraordinary degree qualify for consideration. The handsome Dias was admired by young ladies in Augusta, and he had dates with many of them. However, soon he was spending most of his social time with Connor Cleckley, a lovely, vivacious, and popular young woman who was two years younger than Dias. Although Jimmy dated a number of young ladies after graduating from college, he found himself wishing to spend more and more time with Connor. Slowly, a romance was blossoming between the tall, strong redhead from Somerville and the lovely young lady who lived nearby. In those days when my mom and daddy were dating, uh, nobody could know that they were serious about each other, so she had to continue dating other people, but he wasn't allowed to. That was part of the rules. He wasn't allowed to date anybody else, but she could date. She had to because you got to keep up appearances. And so they would always have late dates. And so after her first date uh, would leave her at the door, here would come my daddy in his little car. He would climb out of his bedroom window and uh, go down and get in his car and come to pick her up. And so then they would have a late date. And that, ha that was the practice until they got engaged. It wasn't until the summer of 1934 three years after he had returned to Augusta, that Jimmy Dias asked Connor Cleckley to marry him. Wedding arrangements were planned in the late summer and early fall. The wedding was held in the First Presbyterian Church in Augusta at noon, November 7, 1934. Although no invitations were sent out, the church was packed. The day was unusually cold for Augusta, and almost everyone in the church left their overcoats on throughout the ceremony. Soon after the wedding was concluded, the wedding party went back to Connor's home. The newlyweds had some pictures taken and then jumped into their new car and headed south for a honeymoon in Miami. August 29, 1935 was a banner day for Jimmy and Connor Dias, for it marked the arrival of a bouncing baby girl, Connor Cleckley Dias. Baby Connor was to be the only child of the marriage of Jimmy and Connor Dias. The small family continued to live in the Cleckley home for an additional year. Only in 1936, two years after the marriage, was the young Dias family able to afford to rent a small home on their own.
Also in 1936, the Marine Corps announced that a new reserve battalion was to be formed in Augusta. Dias was greatly attracted to the Marine Corps and its grand traditions. The Marines had a richly deserved reputation as being among the very best marksmen in America. Army Reserve First Lieutenant Dias applied for and was granted an inter-service transfer. Soon after Dias joined the 19th Marine Battalion, he took the initiative to join the Marine Corps Reserve Marksmanship Team. First Lieutenant Aquila James Dias, an outstanding college marksman in 1930, was selected as one of 12 members of the 1937 Marine Corps Reserve Team. As might be expected, he also earned the highest recognition for regular marksmanship qualification within the Marine Corps. These marksmanship skills would serve him well when he led 800 Marines into combat. The period from the autumn of 1940, when Dias was called to active duty, to the spring of 1943 was marked by numerous professional disappointments for him. First of all, Augusta's 19th Marine Reserve Battalion, which had worked so hard for four years to become combat ready, was broken up and disbanded immediately after it was mobilized in November 1940. In May 1941, when his air defense training was complete, Dias was assigned to permanent duty with the Marine Corps Barrage Balloon School, which had just been established at Paris Island, South Carolina. Dias had been on active duty for 13 months when the attack on Pearl Harbor shocked the world. On Sunday afternoon Eastern Time, December 7, 1941, Jimmy, Connor, and little Connor, like most Americans, learned over the family radio of the Japanese attack. Little Connor, by 1941, she was no longer called Baby Connor, was six years old at the time. She still remembers sitting by the radio that Sunday afternoon and being shushed up by her parents whenever she tried to talk. And they were all just hovering around the radio. It was one of those, you know, those oval-shaped radios with the little, little circle in the middle. And I just didn't know why all this, all this rapt attention uh, to the radio, so I went running and skipping and singing into the room and was told to be quiet and go away. And I didn't realize why, but it was because they were listening to the reports of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. No American who lived through that Sunday will ever forget it. A surge of outrage, patriotism, and national unity captured the people of the United States. The next day, President Roosevelt made his famous date of infamy speech. He concluded the speech by saying, I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. America, which had tried so hard to avoid war, would now face three enemies. But it would do so with a sense of unity and purpose which was unequaled in American history. At last, the Americans were involved with sustained rage and determination. The military services would soon be engaged in combat on many fronts. The Marines, much more than the other American military services, could focus its attention on one enemy, the Japanese, and on one area, the Central and Western Pacific. In May 1942, Dias was promoted to major, but the promotion did not lead to a job change. He stayed on as the executive officer of the Marine Barrage Balloon School. That same year, the decision was made at Marine Corps headquarters to phase out the Barrage Balloon mission. This was the end of an era for the Marines. Never again would they try to defend vital areas using tethered balloons. Shortly thereafter, Dias was assigned to that part of the Marine Corps that was his real love, the infantry. Finally, the years of frustration were over for Dias. And in February 1943, he and his men would be stationed at Camp Pendleton, California. No longer was Dias regulated to training people in secondary missions and sending them off to air defense units. 
At last, he was an integral and important part of the heart and soul of the modern Marine Corps, a combat infantry battalion. Soon after he arrived at Camp Pendleton, Diaz was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, and on the 14th of May, 1943, officially assumed command of the battalion of which he had been acting commander since March. The Separate Infantry Combat Battalion now had a new name, the 1st Battalion of the 24th Marine Regiment. The men under his command were all full-fledged members of the United States Marine Corps and very proud of it. But no one was prouder than the 34-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Dyess, who had joined the Marine Corps Reserve as a first lieutenant seven years earlier in hopes one day of commanding a major operational unit. He was greatly honored to be put in command of 800 combat Marines. The mature and wise Lieutenant Colonel Dias understood and nurtured the relationship of trust and mutual respect between him and his troops, both officer and enlisted. He would do anything he'd ask you to do, and he could do anything that he asked you to do. Uh, and you knew that. My first meeting with this, <laughs> with this man, this officer, this uh, commander, uh, was what we called, we had a, what was called a field day. And a field day meant that you cleaned up the ward rooms thoroughly. And of course we did, we took everything out, took hoses to everything, wiped everything off and so on. And uh, then the order came on inspection. We jumped to, stood at our bunks, at the end of our bunks, and I see this huge man enter the doorway or come to the doorway. And I thought, oh, here we go. And uh, before he stepped in, reached in his pocket, took out some white gloves, put them on his hands. I thought, what the devil is he going to do now? And the first thing he did was go around the frame on the outside of the doorway with his hands, and then to look to see if there was any dirt on the gloves. And I thought, we're really in for it. Well, he walked into the wardroom, and he did that with the bunks. He did that with the walls. He did it with the bed springs, uh, with everything. And uh, that told all of us something about Colonel Dias. When he said, this is going to be clean, he meant it. Uh, and that was kind of true in, in, in our training with him the very short period of time. When he said, we will gain this objective or do it in this manner, it was done in that manner. And uh, he, is, he is or was that kind of man. The 4th Marine Division was to fight in four major battles from February 1944 until May of 1945. Roy Namor, Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima. Although the division itself never numbered more than 25,000 at any one time, a total of 81,718 Marines assigned to it saw combat action with the division one or more times. There were 17,722 casualties, killed, wounded, or missing in action in this 16-month period, the highest rate of any Marine division in history. On the 20th of July, 1943, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington directed Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, to mount an operation in January 1944 to capture the Marshall Islands. The campaign for the Marshalls was given the code name Operation Flintlock. Of all the joint operations that took place against the Japanese in the first 26 months of the war, Operation Flintlock would prove to be the most important from both a strategic and an operational perspective. Now, the atolls did offer certain advantages. They formed natural anchorages that could be used as an advanced base for ships. They also, these little atolls, the islands forming the atolls, could be scraped down to form a coral airstrip very easily. And I did a little of that myself as an engineer. You scraped it flat, you rolled it, you rolled it, you rolled it, the fresh coral turned into something very much like concrete, and you had a good strip that could handle propeller-driven 
aircraft. And that would be a principal use of the marshals once they were taken. Those atolls have to be seen, really, to picture what they really are. They're just a string of little coral sand islands, just like a necklace of coral thrown into the ocean. Up until late 1943, the American strategy in the Pacific had been largely defensive. To stop the Japanese from capturing more territory, to keep them out of Australia and New Zealand, and to secure the Allied flank in the South Pacific. With the impending amphibious assault on two islands in the Marshalls by the Marine Corps and the United States Army, this strategy was about to make a dramatic change. The new approach was designed to initiate a sustained offensive drive through the Central Pacific in order to secure the bases that would be needed to support a final attack on the Japanese home islands. At last, the Navy had the opportunity to implement a strategy that had been under development since 1907. Packing up for the long trip to the Central Pacific was a major operation for the men of the 4th Marine Division. These men were headed for long-term combat. The vast armada of ships that approached the marshals in late January 1944 was the largest that had been assembled in the Pacific up to that time. As far as you could see, we were surrounded by ships. We were on a uh, troop transport, and that uh, <laughs> is not uh, what you would call luxury travel. I, if I remember right, the bunks were somewhere between five and eight high with about uh, maybe a foot between the bunks. And that was your time. And this is all below decks, maybe two decks down. Uh, you, had, you had your pack and your rifle uh, all in the same space. And whatever time we had aboard ship, uh, we had uh, little space we did do some physical training, a lot of instructions about the battle, where we were going, uh, a lot of uh, cleaning of weapons, firing of weapons, testing, sharpening knives, that kind of a thing. And at night, uh, if you were lucky, you found a place aboard deck to sleep because it was so hot down below. You had to observe uh, and sequence by plan a deck space for physical exercise. And of course, there was uh, all kinds of attempts at relaxation where when it was off-duty time, uh, men were sleeping on the uh, deck, curled into positions you could not believe, playing cards. Of course, the money was put away whenever the horse or the day could come by, uh, reading the paperbacks, writing letters, sleeping, so on. On the long journey, Jimmy Dias was quite fatalistic. Although he shared his private thoughts with very few, he did tell a couple of people that he thought he would be killed in combat. In fact, he, he was the epitome of a Marine officer. But I found out later from several other officers that uh, at certain times he did have uh, some moments when he would talk to them quietly about his feelings about the impending battles. One man in particular, a uh, captain, his name was Schechter, Buck Schechter, uh, a hell of an uh, fighter. Or Schechter said that uh, Dias told me he didn't think he was going to make it to this first battle. Maybe he knew uh, that uh, a person with his kind of feelings under those circumstances, his chances of surviving were almost nil. Because I don't think he could stand by and, and see something happen to another individual in front of him without him trying to do something about it. So maybe that was the key to it. Never thought of that till now. For three consecutive nights before the main assault on Roy de Moore, the Americans hit the Japanese with lethal fire from an impressive array of naval ships. And it was not just, of course, the surface ships. Uh, the carriers uh, had the planes run, coming in in what seemed to us like an endless run of dive bombing attacks. So the noise and the smoke and uh, the massiveness of this uh, seemed uh, overwhelming. But of course, we knew from previous experience 
uh, and what has happened in other marine landings, that this was not going to do the job. And the job was going to be done by the rifle companies that went in there face to face. And the final uh, rally began at 0500. He went down into the hold of this LST, and really it was like a, a scene from uh, uh, a Hollywood movie. It was this cavernous hole lit by these red battle lamps. The roar of these prehistoric monsters turned out to be the LVTs, landing vehicle tracks and tracks, which we would exit in. And the scene there was one that anybody that went into those holes, as Colonel Dias men did, as he himself did, uh, was uh, unforgettable. And of course, we hadn't been in those LVTs uh, for about, it seemed like two seconds, we were soaking wet. We head on in, after some confusion, I might add, at the line of departure. Well, now the final bombardment is finishing off in a crescendo. The smoke, the debris, the noise is indescribable. And then, of course, as we get close to the beach, it lifts. By that, I mean the assault, bombardment, and plane bombing lifts. But the smoke does not lift. As we head in for the beach, we're about 100 yards offshore. My uh, platoon sergeant and I are peering over the just the gunnel of our LVT, and wham, his whole head just disappears in a gory mass. He's six inches from me. Well, this was a shocking start for landing when you haven't even yet gotten to the beach, and this is your key non-commissioned officer. So it was a uh, brisk start. By the time the Marines hit the beach on Roy Namor, more than half of the Japanese soldiers on the island were dead. Many others were punchy and weary from days and nights of relentless heavy bombardment. On Namor, the Japanese had stored large quantities of munitions, including bombs, artillery rounds, and torpedo warheads inside a large bunker. One of the first Marines to reach the shore threw a satchel charge into a large structure and lit off this huge ammunition dump. There was a tremendous explosion. A blockhouse filled with aerial torpedoes and bombs exploded. Uh, someone called it the second largest explosion in the Pacific next to the atomic bomb. And we lost so many men there and it destroyed any cohesion we had. At this point, 01, a lieutenant asked me as a scout and sniper to take a patrol ahead and scout directly up ahead of our lines. I didn't realize that it was a decision by the division to hold the troops at point 01 and not proceed after us. So we were in the middle of Japanese territory alone and not realizing it. And without, without knowing it, we had walked through what the Japanese called spider traps. Uh, holes that were built in the ground and covered with, with debris that people could walk on, that they could lift like a door. So the spider traps were on two, maybe three sides of us. And on the left side was this Japanese heavy machine gun. And after we had walked through, they started, once we were amongst them, so to speak, they started firing at us in all directions. The lead man, the point man on the patrol was killed almost instantly. He was hit in the chest, direct, right in the heart. And others fell. The fire was coming on four sides of me, but the most devastating was the machine gun that would hit just in front of this small branch and the, and the bullets would bounce. And then apparently he would move it up a click and would fire over me. So I was in the gap between the two of them. Any one of those machine gun bullets had hit any one of us. We were, we were dead, as was the first man. Well, we were caught there for, a, gee, I don't recall how long. And I, in my own mind, I thought, this is, uh, I don't know how we're ever going to get out of here. Well, that's when now comes Colonel Dias. Uh, I heard uh, some firing, some strong firing on my right side, very strong. And I thought, what's happening now? Are they bringing up more troops? And I realized it was not, it was our 
weapons, our rifles, our machine guns, and so on, coming up on the right, and they broke through. And the first person I saw was Colonel Dias. He was standing there in front of a half track, standing straight up. I will never ever forget seeing him the first time, standing straight up and tall, erect. He was a man, a Marine. He was standing up in front of this half track, and the machine gun had raised its fire over me, directing it at Colonel Dias and the half track. And the bullets were hitting the half track and hitting the tires all around him at his feet and so on. And he never moved except to direct a man to do this or men to do that. His men came in, pulled us out of this uh, cul-de-sac or whatever you want to call it, this trap, and they took us back to this excavation from the huge explosion. And we were, and they brought us in there. Dias directed some corpsmen to take care of the wounded. And then he went back, he stayed with his troops. And uh, that was the last I saw of Colonel Dias. The second day of the battle, February 2, went well for the Marines. Although the Japanese soldiers continued to fight ferociously, their situation was increasingly dismal. As the battle continued throughout the morning, Dias was up front, pointing the way toward the enemy firing positions as he led seven light tanks up Narcissus Road. The tanks were supported by two of his own infantry companies, Abel and Charlie. In addition, he sent three tanks and two half-tracks to the right of the main attack. These elements were proceeding up the beach line, engaging pillboxes and Japanese soldiers who were firing from trenches. Dias was a virtual dynamo of energy, encouragement, and direction. He was leading men, most of whom were still teenagers, who were experiencing their first days of combat. Most slept very little the night before because of the shift schedule, the rain, and the noise and confusion from bonsai attacks throughout the night. After two nights with little or no sleep, they were weary and scared. You get to the point of saying, what am I doing here? And I think the realization to a very young man, as I said, I was 18 then, I believe, the realization that someone is trying to kill you is a very, very difficult one to handle. And I must say that the Marine Corps philosophy of driving home that you are a Marine and that you can do it really carried us through. You must remember that World War II in the Pacific was a very savage war. I use the word savage advisedly. It was savage on both sides. There were none, none of the little nuances of chivalry that sometimes appeared in Europe. None of that. The Japanese lived by the code of the Bushida. Sacrifice. A terrible disgrace for a Japanese to surrender. Very few of them did surrender, almost none. They fought until they died. Dias was not only giving directions and support, he was also firing in Japanese positions. As Dias moved up and down the line, a number of Marines yelled at him to stay low and keep his head down. He ignored their pleas. He wanted to direct the fire of his fellow Marines, and in order to do so, exposed himself to Japanese rifle and machine gun fire. At about 10.45 on D2, the 2nd of February, Dias rose up once again to observe the enemy firing positions and to direct fire against them. His attention was directed toward the last of the Japanese pillboxes that was still occupied and still sending out deadly fire against the Marines. Within seconds of the time he raised up, Dias was hit in the head by a Japanese bullet probably from a machine gun that was firing from the pillbox to his immediate front. Killed instantly, he fell backwards. Moving quickly, Willie Turner, Bob Fleischauer, and two others grabbed a stretcher and gently placed him on it. Using this stretcher, they lifted Dias and, picking their way through the debris of the battlefield, carried him the half-mile distance to the beach.
the only child of Jimmy and Connor Dias, little Connor, had lost at age eight a father whom she had said farewell to only a month earlier in California. Usually I didn't take him, I didn't go, I never went with mama to take him back to, the, to, to camp except this one time and I was allowed to go and I didn't know really why but I did go in the car with him and he he kissed us all he kissed us both goodbye at the gate and walked through the gate and I can remember saying to mama I'm not going to see him anymore am I and she says that's right and we didn't know it was going to be never again but I just I just sensed that he was going off on April 26, 1944, Admiral Nimitz held a special ceremony to recognize a few heroes of the Pacific War. He made a special point to highlight the heroism of a Marine Corps private and a lieutenant colonel. The lieutenant colonel was Dias. On July 18th, an official announcement was made that Lieutenant Colonel A.J. Dias had earned the Medal of Honor on Roy Namor. They will tell you that they don't wear the medal for themselves, that they wear the medal for those who may have died in that particular action for which they were awarded the medal. So these are individuals uh, very private. Uh, they uh, are, for the most part, reluctant of the celebrity that is often thrust upon them because of their unique uh, position. And they are just very, very patriotic individuals. Uh, they uh, have a true love and respect for the flag. Uh, they care deeply about uh, this country. Uh, and they want to uh, spend a lot of time talking about their values and their beliefs to the youth of America. And I think it's that kind of message that we need to develop programs within the society that will cause that message to be carried forth uh, after the society is no longer with us. People will do phenomenal things if they know that you're part of it. That uh, when you're in harm's way and the bullets are flying, that if uh, you put yourself in the same danger as your men and you work with them to accomplish something, they're gonna work harder. They know that you care as much about them as you do your mission. And I think that Jim Dias was one of those. Everybody around me was either killed or wounded already. And that represented a significant proportion of the battalion. Um, we were in a, a completely untenuous uh, a tactical situation. And I've got to be honest, the only thing that went through my mind, other than the shrap, was a, a pithy aphorism that I attributed to Hillel, the great medieval rabbi. And, and, and it was, if not you, who? And if not now, when? War is no picnic, and I was scared the entire time I was subjected to it. But having said that, I can also say that that doesn't necessarily mean that you crawl into a hole and you wait for everything to pass, pass over. Because you're not going to live long enough, and no, none of your friends are going to live long if you do that. You've got to overcome your fear, and I think that's where moral courage comes in. You've got to force yourself to do what you otherwise do not want to do. The publicity concerning the awarding of the Medal of Honor highlighted the citation, but did not give the full background of Dias's heroism. For instance, no mention was made of his taking charge of the entire regiment on the afternoon of February 1. Also, there was no mention in the citation of his risking of his life to fight his way through enemy lines to save Frank Pokrop and the other wounded Marines late that same day. It would be 44 years before the full story of his heroism in combat was understood by the family and most of his friends. As I think back to this experience, there's uh, one thing which is preeminent in my mind. It's, it's a lot of years later, but uh, it's a very emotional thing to me still. And that is what these Marines were able to do. The training they had, which was so intensive, prepared them for this. And I don't mean just prepared them in how to handle their weapons and so on. It prepared them 
emotionally and motivationally. And therefore, what they were able to do under horrendous circumstances where men are dying all around you, if enemy's fire is coming down your throat, nobody falters. When the lieutenant gives you the order, it gets done. But I owe, what, what do I say, 18, just about 60 years of life to Dias. And the, the colonel, uh, I, I, I have never forgotten him. And when I first saw Connor dedicating that field, I had to tell her what I knew about him and what I felt about him. I thought it was important for her to know. Uh, he, is, he gave me 60 years of life and a family and so on. Uh, I, sometimes people say, will say, well, what did you think of Dias? And there's a phrase that comes to my mind. He was a man among boys, all the way. For more than 100 years, the Carnegie Medal has been awarded to civilians who, at great risk to their lives, save or attempt to save another. Over 8,700 medals have been awarded since 1904, when Andrew Carnegie, the great American philanthropist, first established the award. It is very rare to have an act of heroism, deserving of the Carnegie Medal, to have been captured on camera. Yet in 1982, when an airliner crashed in the frozen Potomac River, the cameras were there. They had dropped two lines from the helicopter, one girl, grabbed one of them, and there was a man and a, a girl grabbed the other one. The guy's hanging on to the buoy and the girl's hanging on to him. And the helicopter starts coming towards the bank. First girl falls off, then uh, second girl falls off, and she's on a slab of ice. She grabs the, the buoy again um, with both hands, starts towards the bank. The minute she comes off the ice slab, one of the arms comes out of the, the buoy. At that second, I'm taking my boots and my coat off, and um, I've decided I'm going in after. So I make my way to the embankment, dive in the water, swim out to her, position myself behind her the best way I could. So I just grabbed her, give her a little push, get her head above water, and then fireman waded in, um, grabbed her, and then I swam off to the side, and that, that was mission accomplished. The Carnegie Heroes Fund Commission awarded its first medal to 17-year-old Louis Bauman, who in 1904 saved a childhood friend from drowning. In 1956, Dorothy Koch, a dancer, was awarded the medal when she saved the lives of two policemen in a shootout in a Cleveland nightclub. In the shootout, she was hit by a bullet and was paralyzed for the rest of her life. A world-ranked boxer, Riddell Stith, was one of only four people to have earned the Carnegie Medal twice. In 1958, he risked his life to rescue a man from drowning in the Ohio River near Louisville, Kentucky. Two years later, he attempted the rescue of another man from drowning. In the first instance, both men survived, but in the second attempt, both men drowned. Anyone interested in learning more about the Carnegie Medal is invited to read A Century of Heroes. Edited by Doug Chambers, this book highlights the heroic acts of many recipients, and a brilliant chapter entitled Why Do They Do It explains the various motivations which causes individuals to act with such courage and compassion.
community, an institution, or a nation can be judged in large part by how well it honors its heroes. Jimmy Dias is remembered in the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps, in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, in Augusta, Georgia, at Clemson University, by the Carnegie Heroes Fund Commission, by the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation, and by the Boy Scouts. Although the USS Dias was decommissioned in 1981, crew members from the USS Dias get together every year to honor Dias and the grand ship named in his honor. The Marine Corps has honored Dias by naming the headquarters of the 24th Marine Regiment in Kansas City in his honor. On the island of Roy Namor in the Marshall Islands, the key airfield is named Dias Field. This island provides a vital link in America's space tracking system, which serves the Department of Defense and NASA. On the outskirts of Augusta, Dias Parkway, which was opened and dedicated in 1998, connects the main gate of Fort Gordon with Interstate I-20. This vital four-lane parkway would be essential in any national emergency involving the soldiers of Fort Gordon. In the Augusta Museum of History in downtown Augusta, there is a permanent exhibit on the second floor which honors Colonel Dias, the USS Dias, and the USS Augusta. On Hero's Overlook in Augusta, at 10th Street and the Savannah River, Dias's heroism is highlighted. On May 7, 2004, at Clemson University, at the commencement services, 13,000 people were in attendance. One individual was given an honorary degree, Doctor of Humanities. That individual was Aquila James Dias. The citation for this award stated in part, Clemson University holds Lieutenant Colonel A. James Dias and his lifetime of service above self in highest esteem. It is a distinct privilege to honor him for his untold contributions to our nation's defense and for his acts of valor beyond the call of duty. We present to his family the posthumous honorary degree of Doctor of Humanities. On October 16, 2004, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Carnegie Heroes Fund Commission celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Carnegie Medal. A book, A Century of Heroes, was published at that time. Many of the remarkable stories of civilian heroism are outlined in this book. Chapter four, entitled The Remarkable Jimmy Dias, tells his unique story. In the meantime, the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation published a book, Medal of Honor, by Peter Collier. This book highlights the life stories of our living Medal of Honor recipients. In the chapter on the history of the Medal of Honor, the story of Jimmy Dias is told. In 2011, the Jimmy Dias Symposium was initiated in Augusta, Georgia. The symposium has five major goals. First, to preserve and enhance the legacy of Marine Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Dias the only person to have received America's two highest awards for heroism, the Medal of Honor and the Carnegie Medal. Second, to salute outstanding Americans who, over a lifetime, have made major contributions to their nation, their community, and their fellow citizens. In 2011, Medal of Honor recipient Jack Jacobs was honored. In 2012, Congressman Doug Bernard and Medal of Honor recipient Bruce Crandall were honored. All three received the Jimmy Dias Symposium's Distinguished American Award. Three, to support the Medal of Honor Foundation by drawing widespread attention to its mission by perpetuating the Medal of Honor's legacy through outreach and collaborative efforts. Four, to welcome people from all over America who visit Augusta to attend the symposium and to meet and visit with the honorees. Five, to lend public support for the Augusta Museum of History 
In this award-winning museum is a permanent exhibit which honors Jimmy Dykes. As the only person to have earned America's two highest awards for heroism, Dias and his story may well remain a unique legacy for all time.